Good morning to you all from the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, COP26. In one way, a blah, blah, blah fiesta of political noise, all those fences, that jargon, the backslapping and the vacuous self-regard. But here's another way to think about it, because all around us, growing louder each year, there is a drumbeat of looming crisis. The disappearance, forever, of beautiful and complicated living things. The vanishing of extraordinary tracts of this planet. Droughts, extreme weather, rising seas. Alok Sharma, president of this summit, says that if we reach two degrees of warming, which is the lower end of where we're heading now, two billion people will face extreme heat waves and all of the world's coral reefs will die. Now, this is also doomy that many of us pretend it isn't happening. But mankind, alongside being a greedy and infuriating species, is a very clever ape. We explore deep space, we're healing the ozone layer, we create new vaccines in a heartbeat. So maybe we are also smart enough and tough enough to turn this around too. Welcome to Glasgow. It's more than blah, blah, blah. I'm joined live this morning by the COP26 president, Mr Sharma, by Labour's Shadow Energy Secretary and former leader, Ed Miliband, and from the front line of climate change by the envoy of the Marshall Islands, Tina Steger. But this conference is attracting protesters as well as politicians, and I sat down earlier this week with Greta Thunberg. Reviewing the news with me in Glasgow this morning is Pippa Creera, political editor of the Daily Mirror, and Rachel Watson, deputy political editor of the Scottish Daily Mail. But first, the news in Salford comes from Nina Warhurst. Andrew, thank you. Uh, world leaders will be making their way from the G20 summits in Rome to Glasgow today for the start of the COP26 climate conference. Before they set off, Prince Charles will warn them they have an overwhelming responsibility to future generations to fix the climate crisis. Meanwhile, the COP26 climate summit gets underway in Glasgow. More than 25,000 people representing nearly 200 countries will be in attendance. The aim of the two-week event is to commit to measures to limit the rise in global temperatures and cut emissions. Alec Baldwin has described the death of a colleague on the set of his film as a one-in-a-trillion episode after he accidentally shot her with a prop gun. Speaking in public for the first time since cinematographer Helena Hutchins died on the set of the Western film Rust, the actor said he would be in favour of limiting the use of firearms on films. He also confirmed production of the movie was unlikely to resume. As pupils return after the half-term break, health teams will visit hundreds of schools across England to offer those aged 12 to 15 a coronavirus vaccine. The Office for National Statistics says the percentage of people testing positive remains highest among school-aged children. Young people are also being urged to take a Covid test before returning to the classroom to minimise the spread and disruption of lessons. That's it from me. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Andrew. Many thanks, Nina. And let's concentrate today on the Scottish front pages. There's an entirely different press in Scotland. The Sunday Mail, not connected with the Daily Mail in England, uh, has Greta Mania, a big picture of Greta Thunberg arriving at Glasgow Station yesterday and being mobbed. That's on many, many front pages. Scotland on Sunday, same image. World's moment of truth as the Climate Change Summit begins. The Scottish Sun on Sunday, Glass Chance Saloon, it says, and a lot of coverage inside as well. The Sunday National, the independent supporting newspaper, says stop the world, Scotland is on. And then finally we've got the Sunday Post, which is a rather beautifully drawn front page saying it's time, the world turns. And today uh, the world turns to Scotland, it says, at the COP. And inside lots of really good coverage again. We'll talk about that later. This is the Scottish edition of the Sunday Times. In the English edition they've gone with their MOD story as the splash, but here it's about Scottish MPs, MSPs, pension funds have got fossil fuel holdings. That will be followed up, I'm sure, today in Scotland. The Observer has been looking at what's been going on in Rome, the summit there, just before this one, where France and the UK have been told, end the dispute, this is the dispute over fishing, or you'll wreck the COP26 summit. 
And the Sunday Telegraph has the same story. There, there's the, the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie, in Rome at the Colosseum. Johnson demands the EU rein in Macron. So an awful lot to talk about. Let's start, Rachel, with you and the, co the coverage of COP, which is what, why we're here in Glasgow. Yeah, and I think, as you mentioned, a lot of the Scottish front pages today have really gone on this pride that Scotland has about hosting COP26. Mm. You know, this is the biggest event. We've had so many world leaders come to Scotland. This doesn't happen very often. And there's a lot of pride, and you see that on the front pages. You mentioned the Sunday Post, which is a really beautiful front page today and talks about the significance of this event. And, you know, Scotland won't be at that um, the table with the world leaders negotiating, but Nicola Sturgeon is co-host of this under two coalitions and um, with other devolved nations, regions and states across the world. So I think there's huge pride, and that's what you see on the front pages, but when you open up the papers, um, they talk a little bit more about the disruption that will also come to Scotland, because I think there's two sides of this. One, yes, people are very excited to see people like President Joe Biden in Scotland, for example, but also, you know, there's a lot of people whose lives are going to be um, hampered by this across the next few weeks. There's road closures, for example, um, quite significantly around the COP26 conference, um, but also other things. Um, people talk about the disruption right now of this, but there's also concerns the Sunday Mail have um, the Clyde divide um, as a double-page spread today, talking about um, not only the disruption, but also the mess that they've seen in Glasgow. They have concerns. They're talking about the environment, but they're talking about fly tipping, for example, or so rubbish that needs picked up. There's been a lot of coverage in the press in the run-up to COP about the disgraceful state of Glasgow and how terrible it's looking. And it's not just because I was born not very far away from here. <laughs> you can tell by the accent, I'm sure. Um, but actually, I was wandering around Glasgow yesterday and it was absolutely beautiful. It was sunny, it was looking clean, it was busy, it was friendly. There were, there were demonstrations, but they were cheerful and colourful. The city was looking really great. I think there is, and that's reflected in these papers, that there's been work done on the city centre and around yeah. the COP26 venue. There's been a lot of work put in by the council in those areas. But when you read this, you know, they talk about Govan, the other side of the Clyde, where people you know, are talking about when is this mess, when is the rubbish going to get picked up, when is the fly tipping. As you said, over the last few weeks, you just have to pick up any paper mm. and there's images of the city centre. But this also talks about... Um, the piece in the Sunday Mail talks about the risk of COVID mm. after this, which is concerning people in Glasgow and widely, more widely across the central belt. Because people have been huddled together so much in sort of hot hotel rooms and Exactly. Bars and There's restaurants. around 25 to 30,000 people coming to Glasgow. Scotland has struggled over the last couple of months. We've got our figures down, our COVID numbers mm. down, but they've kind of flatlined at the moment at around 2,500 cases a day. So there's now that concern of what will the consequences for Glasgow and Scotland be? Will mm. we face further restrictions? because we've hosted this massive conference. I mentioned the Sunday Post just now. Um, there's a woman called Nan Shepherd who appears on Five Pound Scottish Notes, and she's a great, great... She was a great Scottish novelist, poet and nature writer. And uh, she really features in, in their analysis, which I thought was supremely good today. Yeah, I think the Sunday Post has really done a great job on COP, actually. They've got a great a number of features and analysis pieces in the paper. And this piece on Nan Shepherd as well is actually a really great read for anybody who picks up the paper today. Um, and about around her inspiration from Scotland, because this is a chance for Scotland to show off, mm. not just Glasgow, but the wider country. And it talks about her inspiration from the Cairngorms and the mountains of Scotland. So, yeah, it's a great read. And there's a, a great piece. quote from her as well on the yeah, paper, uh, in the paper yeah. um, about uh, the Cairngorms and the, the water. And stuff. Yes. So it's great. Pippa, a lot of your colleagues are in Rome or coming back from Rome. That's where the, the political class has been gathering for the G20 there, the Pope lecturing them about climate change and so on. Mm -hmm. And the, the story in Rome has been as much about the really nasty little local row between Britain and France over fishing as about COP. That's right. I mean, it was kind of a staging post to this summit and all eyes internationally are mm. obviously on Glasgow with 120 leaders, not including uh, the leaders of China and Russia and Brazil, it must be said, who are major emitters coming here. But many of them gathered in Rome, first of all. And while there were other things on the agenda, there was women's rights, there was coronavirus vaccines and how you get them spread around the world, a lot of the summit was overshadowed ahead of, ahead of um, COP by this row of fishing, which has uh, broken out in the last few days. And it might seem like a very local row, really, when it, because it's ultimately about one trawler and, and whether it's breached permit rights under the new Brexit agreements for fishing in the Channel. But it's obviously, um, it, it obviously demonstrates a much deeper schism between France 
and the UK. Uh, we have uh, President Macron feeling a bit hurt about the AUKUS defence row. He's obviously got a presidential election next year. And there's mm. all the rumbling still going on over the Northern Ireland border. Somebody said to me that relations between Britain and France have not been as bad as a politician saying in my lifetime. Well, it's certainly, Brexit has certainly led to a situation where they're on very, um, really poor terms. I mean, we saw the images yesterday in Rome of Boris Johnson fist bumping Emmanuel Macron. But, you know, don't be, don't be uh, lured into thinking that they, despite their personal relationship, that the, the country's relationship is yeah. strong at the moment. We've seen this war of words most recently with David Frost suggesting that they could mm. potentially take action. The Observer talks about how they... Um, could trigger, Britain could trigger the, the Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which could actually trigger a trade war and potentially months of now, dispute, disputes and talks. I don't know if we can see any of these pictures, but it has to be said that Boris Johnson produces a good news picture. He looked at one point like he was about to thump <laughs> Macron. The two of them were confronting each other on, on the stairs there. It's been a very vivid... But the real danger, of course, is that that overshadows what's going on in, in Glasgow here. Um, and it's interesting because Prince Charles is going to speak to the leaders before they all come here. And he is emphasising something that's important to remember, which is that, you know, we talk about the politicians and the public sector, but actually it's private companies and the private sector who are very, very important in changing attitudes and changing behaviour on climate change. Yeah, and this comes from another story that's going to be big over the next two weeks for the papers and the fact that the Queen um, is taking a slight leave from her duties, taking a step back over the next two weeks and won't be at COP26. She's one of the people that we expect to be here. So Prince Charles is going to make this speech tomorrow. And as you say, we expect him to talk about how the private sector and businesses play a role in this. And I think that's something that world leaders, it's everything, something everyone needs to think about, is how we take businesses mm. with us, how we take people with us, because that's one of the biggest challenges for these people who have to make all these decisions on our behalf mm. and say what we're going to do and how they're going to reach these um, tar global climate change targets yes. and the people that they've got to take with them, which are so important, our businesses and the general public in changing those behaviours. Mm. Pippa, do you think your readers uh, understand or uh, are just being kind of receiving the information from the politicians or mm -hmm. do you think there is a real kind of swelling enthusiasm among mirror readers uh, and, and other newspaper readers for the changes that they're going to have to make, you know, changing their heating system, stop eating so much yeah. meat, look, thinking about driving and flying. Well, I think one thing that this has done is focus attention on all of those things that you mentioned about people having to make decisions about changing their own lives. Um, it, I think what our difficulty is always trying to sort of demonstrate to people how all this talk about keeping global temperatures rising just to 1.5 degrees, um, you know, coal, car, coal cash cars and trees, I'm sure you'll hear more from Alok Sharma later on all of that, um, how that relates to their own lives and why it's important that people aren't overstating it when they're saying this is a summit to save the world. The Prime Minister is very downbeat about the chances of limiting the rises in global temperatures. I think there's a lot, big question mark over whether this is going to be the staging post that's needed in order to cut emissions by the middle of the century. Well, we're going zero. to hear very, very shortly on how the people running this conference think it's going so far or think it will go. Thank you both very, very much to do that. Very, very interesting. And so, as ever, to the weather. Glasgow is... No, not to the weather, I beg your pardon. Alok Sharma was Boris Johnson's business minister. What I would say about the weather is that Glasgow is known as the dear green place for a very good reason. There's a lot of irrigation, and a lot of irrigation is coming from the sky right now. Now, Alok Sharma was the business minister, but he gave that up for what he thought rightly, was a much more important job because he is president of this climate change conference. He describes himself as a kind of global shepherd, herding world leaders for the next few days into, he hopes, an agreement on how to cap global warming. It's a very big task, and he joins me now before heading off to chair the opening ceremony. Nice to see you, Alok Sharma. Morning, uh, first of all, uh, the prime minister himself said that this, if you failed here, this would be a challenge to all of civilization. Civilization would go backwards. Is that an overstatement? Look, I think the Prime Minister is right. This is a huge challenge that we face collectively. Uh, and I would argue that actually what we're trying to achieve here is tougher than what was achieved at Paris. Paris was a great historic agreement, but uh, it was a framework agreement, and a lot of the detailed rules were left uh, to later COPs. And now, after six years, we still have to resolve some of those issues. And of course, the geopolitics mm. is also more challenging than at the time of Paris. In a word, if you fail here, that will be catastrophic. Well, uh, the world needs to come together and ensure that uh, we are doing our bit to limit global temperature rises. It's, but, a, word, it's a word but, you used. But, but I think it's important to put into context where we have come from. Before Paris, 
analysts were saying that we were heading towards six degrees of global warming. After Paris, that temperature curve was bent to below four degrees. And if you look at recent reports from the International Energy Agency, for instance, they tell us that because of the commitments that have been made in the last uh, year or so, that temperature curve has been bent towards two degrees. So there has been progress, but of now, course there's more the, to do. The, the real figure that matters is 1.5 degrees maximum global warming. How likely do you think you're going to have a hard agreement to get to that by the end of this conference in 10 days' time? Well, it's going to be very, very tough, as I said. And uh, what countries are calling for, and I know you're going to be talking to others as well about this on this programme, but what they're saying is that if we look at all the commitments that have been made, and I said we're heading towards two degrees, how is it that over this next decade, indeed over the next few years, we close that gap so that we get closer to 1.5? And that's something that I'm going to have to try and build consensus on at this COP. The UN says that at the moment we're heading to 2.7 degrees. You yourself have said that would mean a billion people facing really, really severe heat and the death of all the planet's global um, uh, coral reefs. That would be catastrophic. That's where we're going for now. So I say to you again, people will be really interested do you think you can limit this to 1.5 degrees in Glasgow or not? Well, first, just if I may say, the 2.7 degrees that you've talked about relate to the 2030 emission reduction targets. If you they don't take into account all the net zero commitments that have been made. And I would just say, Andrew, that when we took this thing on, less than 30% of the global economy was covered by a net zero target. We are now over 80%. Most of the G20, in mm -hmm. fact, have signed up to net zero commitments. So if you take all of that into account, we're heading towards two degrees. But I agree with you. We need to make sure that we are heading lower than that. Uh, and that's why we need to ensure that we get an agreement at this COP. Uh, we, we were talking, well, I'll be talking in a moment to the climate envoy of the Marshall Islands, and she says that anything above 1.5 degrees is utterly catastrophic for her community, her country. I ask you for the third time. Do you think you can hold this to 1.5 degrees at this conference? Sort of more Andrew, or less, Andrew, that, yes or that no? Is, that, as, I, as, as, you did in your, as, as you said in your introduction, my job is effectively to act as shepherd-in-chief. This is on leaders. It was leaders who made the commitment in Paris. It's leaders of the biggest economies meeting now uh, at the G20. And they need to come forward. And collectively, we need to agree how we're going to address this gap. And, you know, you talk about uh, Tina. Tina's right. There are countries that I have visited uh, around the world where 1.5 would be absolutely catastrophic for them. We already have a situation where millions of lives and livelihoods are being impacted because of the rising climate, because of climate change. We see that in every country around the world. And the one thing I can tell you is that every country I've spoken to understands that climate change does not recognise borders. Yeah. And that's why we need to act together. Let's talk about some of the leaders in the countries that you've been to, because... Uh, China announced its proposals, and in the view of an awful lot of people, it didn't take things much further than after Paris. And yet, talking to people around here, talking to some of the lobbyists and the campaigners and so on, there is a growing feeling that the Chinese are engaging a bit more than we expected. Are they persuadable? Well, look, I had constructive discussions with China when I was there uh, in September. I've, I've met uh, some of their team already over the last few days. Um, now, in terms of their NDC, it moved forward uh, somewhat from 2015 in terms of latest NDC, but of course, we, we expected more. And this is a real opportunity for China, for all the biggest economies, to step up and show further leadership here. I mean, China's made some, some commitments in, in terms of coal. Uh, they've said, and I think this really is very meaningful, that they will stop international coal financing. Uh, and they've also said that in terms of domestic coal, yeah. that will start to go down from 2026. We need to see the details of that. Do you, do you think we're going to see more commitments from China? Well, look, I, I want to see more commitments from uh, all countries here. But ultimately, this will come down to what we're able to negotiate. And the key issue, Andrew, as you've pointed out, is that how do we ensure that we limit global temperatures okay. to 1.5 to keep 1.5 alive? Let me ask you about one other very important country, the, set, the world's second largest emitter, which is the United States. Now, President Biden has this big $500 trillion plan but that is stuck in Congress. He wants to limit oil and gas exploration on federal lands, but he's really stuck in the American courts. Can I ask you directly, do you think gridlock in the American political system is a threat to this conference? Well, uh, I know I've spent a lot of time talking to John Kerry and, and others in the US system, uh, and I think they recognise the fact that we need to get this over the line. And look, I'm very pleased that we have an administration in the US now which is totally focused on climate change. Uh, they've uh, come forward with further commitments on finance. Uh, and so, uh, absolutely, we need to ensure the US system, just like every other system, delivers mm. uh, for the planet. So we've talked about uh, China and the United States. The world's 
third biggest emitter, India, doesn't even have a 1.5 or 0 uh, carbon target at all. Are we going to see that from India at this conference? Well, we'll have to wait and see uh, what uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Modi says. What I would say to you is that India has uh, made great strides in terms of uh, renewables. Okay. They've, got, they've got a commitment of 450 gigawatts in terms of renewables by 2030. Uh, what I would like to see is for that to come forward in terms of their 2030 emission reduction target. Can you possibly get to 1.5 degrees as the maximum level of heating if India doesn't agree to net zero? Well, we need all the G20 to come forward. I mean, the G20 represents 80% of global emissions. And that's why every country matters, but the G20 matter particularly. This all depends, in a way, on your and Britain's moral authority at this conference, persuading people to follow a lead. In that spirit, can I ask you about the Cambo oil and gas field to the west of Shetland, which is waiting to, for the go-ahead from this government? Do you think it will help Britain show that moral authority if you allow that oil and gas field to go ahead? Yes or no? Well, Andrew, I mean, it's, it's worth setting out where we've actually got to. So over, I'm over sorry, the I'm asking the you about Cambo. Well, and and, and, and I, I want to put that in context. Um, you know, we as a country have decarbonised our economy faster than any other G20 nation over the past years. And in terms of oil and gas, we've been very clear. We've said that in terms of granting any future licences, there will be a climate compatibility checkpoint and any licences that are granted will have to be compatible with our legal requirement to be net zero by 2050. Sure. The International Energy Agency says that to reach net zero by 2050, no new oil and gas fields can be approved from development from this year. Surely you have it in your power to stop that development. Why won't you? Well, um, it is not, as you say, in, in my power. My role the here is to, my, yes, my role here is to bring together consensus amongst 200, uh, uh, almost 200 sure. countries. But, but, it's but in the government's what, what power, I would say to you, the government. But what I said to you that in terms of the IEA report, uh, what they also make clear that even at a net zero scenario, there is some element of uh, oil and gas uh, in that. But of course, you know, what, what I want to see is us doing even okay. more renewables as we have done over the past decade. I ask again. Does allowing the Cambo oil and gas field off Shetland to go ahead now set a good example around the world? And, Andrew, what I would say to you is that, uh, you know, that is something that is being considered. There was a consultation inquiry around all of that. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, into that particular issue. Uh, you know, when, when there is an a announcement and agreement, of course, I'm very happy to come back and talk to you. My job, Andrew, is to pull together almost but, 200 parties to try and reach agreement here at this COP. But people are looking to you to set an example. Now, the chair of the Climate Change Committee, Lord Deben, former John Gummer, says of the oil and gas field camera that I've been describing, he says, once you do that, once you like to go ahead, you set an example that will be quoted throughout the world as showing that such a development is acceptable, and yet you're not prepared to stop it. Well, as I said, that's not my decision, that's not my role. It's your government's but, but, decision. Well, yes, and as I said to you, when a decision is made, uh, I'm very happy to come back and discuss it. But since you mentioned the Committee on Climate Change, they've also said that the net zero strategy that we have produced is uh, a landmark uh, strategy uh, globally, and it's one that I think other countries will look at and uh, take heed of. And if I was a country looking for a way out, a loophole here, I'd say, look at Cambo, they're not even prepared to stop that. Well... Shall we wait and see what the decision is? We shall. Um, OK, well, let me talk about another thing. Your colleague George Eustace has said the government is looking at taxing high-carbon foods. He means in particular meat and probably in particular beef. When are we going to see the details of that? Well, look, I mean, uh, issues related to tax and spend are for the Chancellor uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what comes forward. You know, I've been very clear that, on a personal level, I'm someone who believes very much in carrot rather than stick trying to encourage people to move in the right direction. So do you think we should all be eating less meat as our part of our contribution to climate change? I mean, that's a personal choice. Um, what we need to make sure as a government is that we are incentivising people to, to make decisions in the same way that we have grants to support people okay. to buy ultra-low emission vehicles. You've got the, uh, the, the boiler uh, uh, money that has now been announced as well in terms of replacing uh, boilers with heat pumps. Uh, th that, I think, is the way that you help people and support them uh, make those, uh, those decisions. One last area. Back in 2009, the developed countries agreed a $100 billion a year uh, sum to go to the countries right on the front line, threatened by climate change right now. Uh, when are they going to see that money? Uh, well, uh, so I, I asked uh, uh, colleagues in the German and Canadian government to put together a de delivery plan. Uh, I think we can say with some confidence that in uh, 2023, that 100 billion will come through, perhaps even earlier. Uh, and actually, over the period 2021 to 2025, 
uh, I think we can say with some confidence that uh, we will go to over 500 billion over that five year period. Uh, but of course, there will be further discussions on finance at this COP. Countries are particularly interested in uh, money for adaptation, the balance between adaptation and mitigation, uh, the, uh, the whole issue of access to finance. So uh, what I would say is that we have made progress, but there is more to do. Uh, and I'll just say this point, Andrew, is that uh, you know, we've got the G20 gathering now, uh, having this discussion uh, in, in Italy. Those leaders will come here over the next few days. And what I would say to them, and today is Halloween, what I would say to them is that, please, let's leave the ghosts of the past, exercise the ghosts of the past, leave those in the past, let's build a better future together, because the one issue that we can absolutely all unite around is protecting our planet. Alok Sharma, you've got a very busy day. Thanks very much indeed for coming in and talking to me just now. Thank you. And so to the weather. I mentioned earlier how Glasgow was reported to be a filthily and filthy and chaotic host for this conference, but yesterday the city, I promise you, was looking magnificent, sparkling and more sun splashed than rain splashed. Now, sadly, that at least has not lasted. So what next for here and for the rest of the country? Over to Sarah Keith Lucas in the Weather Centre. Sarah. Thank you, Andrew. Well, you're not alone there in Glasgow with seeing the wet weather this morning. Many of us woke up to quite a damp start to the day and really through the course of today it's going to be a mix some tricks and some treats thrown in certainly more wet weather to come through the course of the day windy too but it's going to clear its way eastwards for most places there'll be a return to some sunshine through the day so low pressure driving our weather at the moment winds rotating around this area of low pressure this is the weather front that's bringing all the rain this morning. It's clearing northwards and eastwards gradually, but it will linger longest for the north and the east of Scotland. So here's some quite persistent rain. There could be a few flooding problems. Most places seeing a return to sunny spells and a few scattered showers on into the afternoon with top temperatures around about 10 to 15 degrees, a little bit cooler than it has been lately. Into the evening hours, still further showers rattling through on this brisk breeze. Overnight, more persistent rain moves in across the northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland too. Temperatures overnight getting down into single figures, but it will be a frost-free start to the first day of November tomorrow. So Monday then, still some sunny spells, still some scattered showers around, but it's really for the west of Scotland and northwest England that we're going to see the most persistent rain. Flood warnings are still in force in a few regions too, and it's not as warm as it has been recently, with top temperatures around 9 to 14 degrees. Now, earlier on, I mentioned the Marshall Islands to Alok Sharma. They are a collection of small volcanic islands in the central Pacific Ocean, just between Hawaii and the Philippines. Just under 60,000 people live there. For the most part, you don't hear much about what's happening on those islands, but they are central to what we understand about climate change. Earlier on this morning, I caught up with a very busy Tina Stegi, the climate envoy of the Marshall Islands, who was here with the world leaders gathering for COP. My country is made up of atoll islands, and for some people, when you think of an island, maybe Hawaii comes to mind, big mountains, lush forests. Atoll islands are beautiful, but extremely small. Uh, we have lagoons. It's just a necklace of islands around a lagoon, and on the other side is the ocean. Essentially, it's all ocean. We're one long coastline. It's, it's a nation of coastlines. So you're very close to the ocean. What happens to the Marshall Islands if we do see global warming of two degrees or more, which is where we're heading for at the moment? To be honest, two degrees, anything beyond 1.5 is unimaginable for us. My islands are just two meters above sea level. There's no higher ground than that. At 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase, we're looking at global sea level rise of around half a meter, and that creates inundations on a yearly basis. Beyond 1.5 degrees, it really is unthinkable. 1.5 is, is our line that we cannot cross. I'll just come back to that, but you've seen some effects of global warming on the Marshall Islands already, have you? Can you just tell us a little bit about what's happened so far? Well, we're seeing longer and more intense droughts, which is a huge problem for us because we rely on rainwater, really. Um, we used to rely on well water, but with sea level rise that's already happened, many of our wells have turned brackish. And so now we have to collect rainwater in order to have water to drink. Um, so we're already seeing those effects. Uh, at very high tides, we're already seeing water that literally bubbles up through the ground. So it's, it's happening, it's happening now. We're trying to think about what we can do to adapt and survive in the longer term. Um, and we're putting in place plans, but 
uh, we really need to do that with the help of, of, of the rest of the world. Um, so you're seeing the sea levels come up at the moment. Is there anything you can actually do practically to protect yourselves at the moment in terms of sea walls and so forth? Yeah, we're really focused right now on our national adaptation plan, which we're calling our survival plan. And there's going to be things that we have to adapt to in the nearer term, um, nature-based solutions. Some of those will work, but in the longer term, we're going to have to really have transformative adaptation, not just looking at the elevation of buildings, but potentially the elevation of land um, so that we can have some secure place for our people to continue to live. So literally building up parts of the islands higher? Yes. Mm. Now, I'm sorry to bring you back to what you said was unimaginable, 2 degrees or 2.7. People argue about where we're heading for at the moment. If that happens, do you literally lose the Marshall Islands completely? We do not accept that we are going to lose this fight. We can't accept that. We are going to fight to protect our territory, to protect our people. And that is what I'm here to do. That is what my entire government is focused on is ensuring that we have a safe and secure place for for our people and i really want to say that you know we are on the front lines of the crisis we're going to be hit earliest and hardest but this crisis is going to affect us all and if you protect those who are on the front lines you really protect yourself Everybody and your behind children the front lines yes. as well and i think we really learned that with covid mm. we, you are clearly going to need to build a lot of new protections, almost whatever happens. It's a big question about who should pay for that, because clearly Marshall Islanders, there's only, what, 60,000 of you all together. You can't pay for it yourselves. No, we, we absolutely can't. And we're really looking to our partners to, to really understand the, the grave situation that, that we're in. Um, as I said, we're all going to need to adapt, but those who are the larger, wealthier nations, um, who have really created the problem in the first place, unfortunately, have the resources to respond. We do not. And we have to work with our partners to, to be able to respond to this crisis and, and secure our future. Thinking of people at home in Britain wondering about whether Britain should be, as it were, paying to help the Marshall Islands, um, we have, we used to have 40% of our energy coming from coal. It's now down to 1.8%. In other words, Britain's doing quite a lot. And people will look around and think, well, hold on a second. China is responsible for 28% of CO2 emissions at the moment. Surely they should be paying. What would you say to people having, having that argument in their heads at the moment? What I say is that this is a global problem. We all have to do more. And, you know, we're a very small nation. But we have taken this to heart and we really have led by example. We were the first nation to submit enhanced targets. Uh, we have very robust plans in place to switch our own energy systems to, to renewable energy. We're working very hard right now on our national adaptation plan, which I think every country in the world needs to do. And so I think what I would say is, you know, we lead by example. If we can do it, so can everyone else in the world, whether it's China, Britain, or particularly all the nations in the G20 who we're really counting on to make the key difference for all of us. Way back in 2009, there was an agreement from the, the richer countries of the world, two countries on the front line, uh, allocating about 100 billion, uh, I think, a year in terms of dollars to, to countries like yours. Have you seen any of that money? It's been really difficult, actually. Uh, particularly for all the island states, it's very hard to access these very large funds. As you said, we're a nation of 60,000, and I come from a department working on climate that numbers in the tens. And it's a lot of reporting, it's a lot of applications, and so access is a huge issue, but also just the quantity of the funds. I think we know that it hasn't been met, that, that, that commitment hasn't been met. We're not at the 100 billion now. Um, there's a delivery plan out there about how we're going to get there, and uh, we need to see more. I think a lot of people are still trying to focus on how important this moment in Glasgow is. Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, who's got a certain reputation for exaggeration, should put it that way, has said that this is a last chance to save civilization. For the Marshall Islanders, is that literally true? This is a hugely important cop. My country has actually been locked down um, since February of 2020 with no travel outside by any government officials. 
This is the first time that our government has come outside and it's for this COP because we recognize that it is a hugely important moment. It's the moment at which we have to face squarely the fact that we're not on track. There are huge gaps. There's a huge gap. We're not on track to 1.5. This is a moment where we can keep it in sight. We have that opportunity, particularly if the biggest emitters come forward and put new targets on the table and concrete actions that can actually meet those targets. We need to see the ending of fossil fuel subsidy. Coal needs to go. These are the actual actions that can make the difference. And so it's at this COP that we can reaffirm what we promised in Paris, that 1.5 is the road to a safe, secure future. Tina Stege of the Marshall Islands there. Now, with me now in Glasgow is the Labour Party's Shadow Energy and Business Secretary and former leader, Ed Miliband, who was negotiating in Copenhagen. Um, Ed Miliband, you may have heard Alok Sharma repeatedly refused to say that he thought we could limit global warming to 1.5 degrees in Glasgow. What do you think? Do you think it can be done here? Well, look, it was a deeply worrying situation. I think it's really important to set out for your viewers what the task is. The task is to halve global emissions this decade in order to keep 1.5 degrees alive. That's what the scientists tell us will give, a fight, give us a fighting chance of keeping 1.5 degrees alive. Now, at the moment, the UN says we're not going to halve global emissions this decade, we're going to just cut them by 7%. That's the gap. That's the huge gap we have, and that produces the 2.7 degrees of warming. We've got to push really hard at this, at this summit. This has got to be a real negotiation, not people coming along with their pre-prepared pre announcements, but saying, this is where we are, this is where the science is, mm. as Tina Stege was saying, it is existential for countries around the world. We've got to push much, much harder at this summit. So if it's existential, do you yeah. think that climate change should be at the heart of every Labour Party policy now? It, it should be. But let me just say about the negotiations, because I want, to, I want to just say what needs to happen at these negotiations. First of all, we've got to put pressure on every big emitter. Boris Johnson was congratulating Australia this week on its heroic, as he put it, 2050 commitment. Now... Commitments for three decades hence are fine, but we need commitments this decade. And Australia's commitment would take us to a four-degree world. So, first of all, the government has got to put proper pressure on, on the big emitters. No free passes at this summit, whether it's China or Australia or anyone else. Secondly, okay. I want to go back to something you talked about with Alok in, in the interview around this $100 billion. Because mm. I was part of that promise at Copenhagen, along with Gordon Brown. And the countries are simply not getting the money. I mean, it is shameful that this $100 billion has not yet been delivered. Now, this matters morally, but it also matters for this summit, for the right. following reason, Andrew, which is we can only put pressure on the biggest emitters if we have an alliance of developing and vulnerable countries, like the Marshall Islands, and developed countries that want action. That's the pincer movement we need. Me, sure. And that's why... The, the, you know, and us cutting overseas aid, frankly, is reprehensible because it's Let, taken okay. us away from that. So, so we've got to... The part of this summit is about delivering on that 100 billion, on vaccinating the world, mm. because it's shameful that the developing world, only 1% one, 1 of people are uh, vaccinated, this is... and then to put pressure okay. on the biggest emitters. Let's talk about uh, Labour Party policy. Sure. You've been very critical of the government for halving air passenger duty, uh, as they did in the budget. Would you re reinstate that? Tax. We'll set that out at the manifesto. No, but, no, it's but completely... I'm looking for leadership. You say you have to be specific. Yeah, well, look, I'm completely... Lead, so give me some leadership. I'm completely... I'm, look, we, you, you, there's no, no question about our position on this. We're completely against this. And, and let me say why. Because we, we had a budget which was supposed to... Be days before COP26, mm. where the Chancellor had a chance to set out investment okay, plans sure. to retrofit and insulate no, every it's, home. It's, it's and just a very out... simple question. Would you repeal it or not? Well, we're, we're against it and we'll set out our promise at the manifesto. You, you, you get a clear it's, sense it's, of okay. where I'm going. OK, yeah. all right. All right, I can see where you're going, but you haven't really told me yet. Let me ask you about flying more generally. I imagine that you, like me, like most people, came here by train. The UK is not a very, very big country. Do you think we have to get rid of internal domestic flights more or less completely? I mean, not completely, but as much as we possibly can, which is why the domestic air passenger duty decision was the wrong decision. And, but, but, but here's the thing, Andrew, and this is my approach on, on the climate crisis uh, and, and how we tackle it. I mean, We've got about, to give people... Let, what about flying from Manchester just, to London, finish, Birmingham finish, to London? Let me just finish the, the point, if I can. Uh, We've got to give people alternatives. You see, you see, the really regrettable thing about Rishi Sunak's budget is he could have been investing in public transport. He could have been investing well, in train services, in bus services. And, okay. and that's the key. And, and, you know, 
fairness and giving people alternatives is an absolutely key part of making this transition okay. happen. Okay. And this government not making the investments we need means that we don't give people those alternatives. OK, but there are alternatives, London to Manchester. Would you stop people flying from London to Manchester and back again? Well, I don't know about stopping people, but you need to give people the right alternatives and you need to have the right levels of taxation okay. uh, on these things. It doesn't sound that radical at the moment. Let me ask you about something else, which is I think it is radical. Meat. Honestly, it is... no, 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 honestly, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not... Let me, let me well, say why it's... Ra let me... Radical no, is clear answer. No, let me say why it's radical, because we have made a commitment to invest £28 billion extra each and every year to 2030. Rachel Reeves made that commitment. That is an incredibly important commitment. That compares to about £2.5 billion from government. Now, why does this money, why does this investment matter? Because it's saying to people, we are going to make this transition happen and we're going to make it happen fairly. So we're going to retrofit and insulate every home in the okay. country below proper standards. So we, we, we've, we moved, are, we've, moved we are, well, we've moved well away from flights. Let me well, ask no, you no, about something. We, I'm sorry. Andrew, let Andrew, me no, ask no, you about let something else. This, you you continue, you've made many points. You've made many points and you'll make many more. But let me talk about meat because the Committee on Climate Change, the government chief scientists and many others have said we have all got to stop eating so much meat, particularly beef, do need to very, very hard yeah. carbon producing. Yeah. And there should be a tax on food and they mean particularly meat, which produces a lot of carbon. See, is that something that Labour backs well, well, I'm or not? No, look, I'm sceptical about meat tax, and let, let me explain okay. why I'm sceptical about a meat tax. It goes to this fairness point. The British people want us to tackle this problem. Right across the population, they care about this. But they're asking this question. Is this transition going to be fair? And there's a big divide, you see, between us and the government. Because when I make up my point about our investment pledge, it's so that when people have to change their boiler for a heat pump, it doesn't leave them out of pocket. When we're saying to people, transition to electric cars, we're not just saying it's for the rich. We're saying we're going to give support to people on lower and middle incomes to make that transition. When the steel industry says, how are we going to make this transition, we're going to make it possible. So, so we've, we've jumped from meat a... to steel quite quickly. No, no, we haven't, Andrew. This, have. is, this is about fairness being an absolutely right. golden thread, a red thread, if you like, uh, okay. that, a red well, thread from Red Ed, that, that, goes through, that goes through our let's... policy because it's the only way we make this okay. transition fairly. Well, let, let's move to another big, big uh, challenge facing all politicians, sure. probably, which is that Bulb, which is 1.7 million customers, the energy company, looks like it's on the edge. Would Labour nationalise it? I think we need to... There's two options in relation to the energy companies uh, that are in trouble. One is to get their customers taken on by uh, other companies, mm -hmm. which is what's been happening. And secondly, as a last resort, to say we should have a special administration regime where it's held in the public sector. I think we look at both of those options. So that's See, not nationalisation, is it? Well, it would be, actually, in the short term. It would be in the short term, and then they'd go back into the, right. to the marketplace. And I think so what we've got I... to do is the test on this is do you get value for money for bill payers mm. and taxpayers? And that is the key thing. Can I, can I just clear something up? Yeah. Did you think that Keir Starmer was in favour of nationalising the energy companies or not? I thought Keir Starmer, and, he's, and I, I know this to be, continues to be true, believes in a role for common own, ownership in relation to energy. There is a role for common ownership in relation to energy, but there's lots of different aspects to common ownership because... in energy. Let me just finish the point. There's, there's supply, there's generation, there's distribution, and there's, tr and there's uh, the grid. And what we're going to do, the, the, the energy market clearly isn't working. We're going to take a step back and look at what the right way of, 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 of modelling our energy system in the future is. So there's a role for common so, ownership, but we'll set out at, at the election what it is exactly. So back in, in September, you said to Newsnight, we're in favour of common, common ownership. Common ownership, and I'm and repeating and, that and, to you. And, and just wait for Keir Starmer. Now, Keir Starmer, during the leadership campaign, when he was asked whether the uh, electricity companies should be nationalised, put his hand up. And then he told me he was against nationalising no, energy he, companies. What's to changed? Defend, to defend Keir Starmer on this, and to be clear about the position, I, I just said to you, Andrew, that there's many different aspects to the energy system. So there are natural monopolies in the energy system, like the grid and the transmission system. Mm -hmm. uh, th that needs to be looked at. There's generation, there's supply. Okay. So there's lots of different aspects. So it's absolutely consistent what he's saying, which is there's a role for common ownership, and we'll set out exactly what it is at the time of the election, and it will be based on how do we make this transition swiftly, how do we do it in a way that's fair, and how do we get value for money for taxpayers and bill payers. Ed Miliband, defending Keir Starmer. Thanks very much Thank for you. talking to us today. So there's another politician's view. But even as leaders and their entourages are gathering inside the security cordon yesterday in Glasgow, there were also big 
colourful, noisy demonstrations by activists of all ages. They look, above anyone else, to an 18-year-old Swedish schoolgirl who's grabbed the attention of many millions of people around the world. So although she hasn't yet been asked to speak here, she is coming. She's come. And I met her a little earlier this week in London's Natural History Museum, where I began by asking if she thought she had got anywhere with the politicians. I mean, it depends on how you define get to get anywhere. Um, of course, uh, the climate movement has succeeded in like sort of moving the the public discourse and like changing the the debate in it. And the climate crisis has gotten more focus now, and m more people, more and more people are going out on the streets. And that's of course a big step in the right direction. But then of course we have to also see zoom out a bit and see where we are compared to what we would need where we would need to be the global emissions are still increasing and 2021 is projected to experience the second highest emission rise ever recorded so that of course is a clear sign that we are still moving very much in the wrong direction because i guess a lot of the political leaders would say you know i talk about climate change all the time i've allocated big budgets i've set ambitious targets what more can i do for greta thunberg to think that i'm doing the right thing yeah for example, the UK, one popular thing for the UK to say is that you have reduced your emissions by 44% since 1990. And of course that sounds good, it looks good on paper, but if you actually look into to the actual emissions, that's not the case. If you include all emissions like the burning of biomass, consumption-based emissions, and of, uh, like exports of fossil fuels and so on. So of course the situation is always, almost always uh, much worse in reality than what it's being portrayed as. Have you yet spoken to an elected political leader and looked them in the eye and thought, this person gets it? Um, I mean, there are many, many people who want to do more than they, than they are doing and who want to do more than they are able to do um, based on their, like, support from the, their voters. Uh, we must also remember that a politician's job is to fulfil the wishes of the voters. And if there's no massive public pressure uh, from the outside, then they will get away with continuing, like, doing continuing like now. And politicians uh, very often, as, as long as they get away with doing something, and the same as CEOs and lobbyists, as long as they get away with doing something, they will continue, um, unfortunately. So unless we, we really put massive pressure on them, they will continue. Um, what about the Queen? The Queen here has said it's really irritating when people say, but they don't do. Do you agree with her? Yeah, I think most people agree with that. I'm very interested in how the change is happening and at what level of politics it's happening. I mentioned the Queen, but the Pope is leader of a billion Catholics around the world and has been quite outspoken now. Does that make a real difference, do you think? I think when people like that speak up, I think it doesn't make a real difference when they are bold enough. Um, of course, many people just do it because it's, it makes them popular, it makes them sound good. Mm. Um, but of course then I'm sure that there are many people who actually do it because they care as well. Mm. You're 18 now, you could stand for elected office in Sweden. Have you ever thought about doing that yourself? You'd have huge support, I'm sure. I thought of the possibility, but I don't know. Not that I, no, at least not right now. I, what's needed now is um, a big like, change in the narrative that we see the climate crisis. We need it to reach to reach a critical mass with people who are demanding change. And right now it's more efficient to do that on the streets than to do it from inside. But maybe one day, maybe one day in the long future when you've won the, the, the battle in public <laughs> opinion. Uh. <laughs> we'll see. Um, can I ask, um, have you been asked to speak at this climate change conference, COP? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's very unclear, not like officially. Not officially, and why do you think that might be? Because a lot of people say there are not enough young voices at COP. Yeah. Um, of course, this is not just a question about me, mm -hmm. but I think that m many people might be scared that if they invite too many uh, radical young people, then uh, that might make them look bad. And do you think that's what's going wrong with COP already, that there aren't enough of the more radical young voices being heard? Not necessarily the radical young voices, but we need more representation from the so-called global south. It's not fair uh, when, for example, one country sends lots and lots and lots of delegates, and then another country is very underrepresented. That, of course, already creates an imbalance.
Now, this conference is all about keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees. At this stage, do you think that's going to succeed? Do you think that's going to happen? <clears throat> I, I don't know. It can. It's possible in theory. Uh, it's up to us if, if, we, if we want that to happen. Uh, let me ask you about the most powerful person coming to COP in Glasgow, which is President Biden, Joe Biden. He's just announced a £500 billion uh, plan to deal with climate change, and he's been working very, very hard with Congress and so forth. How well do you think he's been doing? Could he be a real leader on climate change? Of course, everyone has the possibility, but if they continue like now, no. I, I, I just wonder what more he can do. I mean, he is challenging in the courts to stop uh, mining and stop oil extraction on federal land. You know, he's used up all his political capital on, uh, in, in Congress to try and get this through. He is working quite hard. Yeah, I, we all understand, activists, we understand that this does not fall on one single person. But of course, when you're a leader of, of the most powerful country in the world, then you have lots of responsibility. And when the US is actually, in fact, in, like expanding fossil fuel infrastructure, that is a clear sign that they are not really treating the climate crisis as an emergency. Was it fair, in retrospect, to say blah, blah, blah about him? It was not directed to one person. I, I took lots of quotes from lots of, um, <laughs> lots of world leaders and say blah, blah, blah. But I think... I think so. <laughs> you think it was fair? Okay. Let me ask you about something another American said, John Kerry, who I interviewed, and he said 50% of the action against stopping climate change is going to come from new technology. What do you say to that? Um, I mean, if that was the case, that would be great. Um, I don't think any activist is against new technology, but we cannot say for sure that we know that this will happen when it's in fact um, based on technologies that today are, to a large extent, prototypes that are not, that are very far from, from working on the scale that they are just counting on them to work. Uh, I think that might be a bit naive. Just turning to Britain for a second, the UK government has just announced it's going to halve taxes on domestic flights. What does that say about U the UK position on leading on climate change? I mean, of course, we can't talk about this in like one single policy and so on. But when you see a, a pattern of, um, of these policies that all the time are avoiding taking real action, and then I think you can draw conclusions from that pattern, that, that climate action is not really our main priority right now. Um, so this is really about public pressure and so on. Big, there's a big controversy in Britain at the moment about tactics, something that you know a lot about, about blocking roads and so on. A lot of people would say that those kind of tactics just put people off. I think as long as, of course, to make clear, as long as no one gets hurt and as long as, yeah, then I think sometimes you need to anger some people. Like, for instance, the school strike movement would never have been so would never have become so big if it, if there wasn't friction, if some people didn't get pissed off. Um, mm. um, COP is taking place obviously in Scotland, and there's an awful lot of people in Scotland, particularly around Aberdeen and the East Coast there, whose jobs, whose livelihoods, whose futures depend upon the oil and gas industry. Now I know that you have spoken to the families of coal miners and coal miners themselves in Germany and similarly in the United States. So what would you say to those people in Scotland who are really worried that their own economic futures are going to be destroyed by these promises? Yeah. Of course we understand. Um, and that's just a, uh, the fact that there is that kind of fear is just a, a clear sign that we have not been handling the climate crisis in the way it should. Because the way we need to is that no one gets left behind um, and that people are being taken care of. Um, so, of course, that's, that's a sign of failure from, from the politician's side. So, to achieve a really, really big change in the kind of public atmosphere, the public mood about this, you need to mobilise millions and millions of people, some of them watching this programme, sitting at home, wondering, you know, they've got their jobs, they've got their bills, they've got their anxieties and their worries and so forth, and you need to get them out onto the streets, you need to get them active. So how do you do that? Yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? I, we will all have to play a part in that, in figuring out how to do that. And that's why, why we are calling for more people to join the climate movement, because we need every possible way. We need 
to push in the right direction from every possible angle. Let me ask you about another thing that people may be thinking. Um, we are being asked in this country to remove gas boilers, change the way we heat and insulate our houses. Um, many families will have big financial hits on all of those kind of things. And they'll be th sitting there at home thinking, why should we be doing this when China, for instance, is still building more coal-fired power stations? Yeah. Why should we be leading? What would you say to Yeah, me? exactly. That's what everyone says. Um, and that's what makes it so hard, because you can always blame someone else. In Sweden, for instance, we can say, why should we do this when you just like look at the UK? I mean, it's always someone that's bigger that you can blame on. And that's why it's more important that we need to work together internationally and globally to make sure that everyone does this transition. Um, not the least pushing China, who are still building coal, coal power plants, which today is quite of out of touch with the reality, if you ask me. And of course, well, of course, but you know, um, you're from Sweden, and like the UK in Sweden, there is freedom to protest and interest in protests and different voices. That's not necessarily the same in China and in Russia and in other countries. Do you talk at all to climate activists, for instance, in China, about yeah. what they're doing? Yeah, I try to um, as much as I can, and it just it puts like our perspective in a whole new perspective because. Um, it makes you just feel so grateful that we are actually able to protest and that just puts more responsibility on us who actually have the right to protest, to use that, to use that right. Um, not just for our sake, but for, for everyone's sake, especially for their sake, to help, to help them as well. Um, let me just talk about, about the future, because you're leading a part of a generation of young climate activists and you've, you've made a lot of waves, you've been you know, talked about a lot. Uh, what do you think you got right and what would you say to the next generation about doing it differently? I think one big thing is that it was so spontaneous, this movement. Um, it just completely blew out of proportion f from nothing. Well, of course, it wasn't from nothing. It wasn't just out of a vacuum because there was this miscontent with how the world was and people were sick of, um, of all the empty words and empty promises from our elected leaders. An advice I would give, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe in the beginning that you will receive lots of criticism in the beginning, but that is necessary in order for the movement to grow. Um, because you change norms very, very quickly. Just some years ago it was being an activist was considered to be something very radical and like something a bit like strange. Now an activist, an activist is something that that people aspire to be. So, um, if you're only hearing words from governments and not the action that you want, um, everything, every time you kind of you launch a campaign and you get attention, then it gets kind of lost in the kind of complexities of democratic politics. Is there a point where you think, Do you know what, Greta, I'm going to give up on this? It's over. I can't make the change I need to make. No, at least at least not now, um, because we know that change is possible. We can just look look back in history and see that there have been massive changes in society that that have been unprecedented. So, and if if we felt like there wasn't any hope, then we wouldn't be activists. We are activists because we are very positive that we can achieve change. I mean, the human mammal has been extraordinary. You know, we've, we, we, we found a cure for polio. They, we've produced a vaccine for the, the coronavirus in just a year. We've done all sorts of extraordinary things. Do you think humanity can respond to the climate crisis in a way that's proportionate and successful? I do. Um, I do. Uh, well, if we switched our focus from trying to create loopholes and excuses to not take action, which is very much the case now, no matter how you see it, um, if we switch f from that focus to actually trying to combat climate change in, in, in a way that would actually solve it, taking into account the whole perspective, then I think that we could, we could achieve massive changes. And of course, we must also remember that there's not a point where everything is lost. There's not like a tipping point where we pause and now everything is lost. There's no point in doing anything. If we can't keep the global average temperature rise to, to below 1.5, then we do 
and then 1.7 and so on. We can always prevent things from getting worse. It's never too late to do as much as we can. All right, Britta Thunberg, thanks very, very much indeed Thank for talking you. to us. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you for watching and thanks to all my guests. I'll be back next week at 9am on BBC One. Until then, pull on your wellies and have a good weekend. Goodbye.